Okay. Welcome everyone, can you hear me? Welcome to Harvard University CMSA Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series. Today is our great honor to introduce our extraordinary talent uh, in the field, uh, Ryan Throngren. He will be speaking about a tool of a categorical symmetry and that's directly welcome, Ryan. Hello, hello. Oh wait, sorry, it's wrong, wrong screen. screen. <laughs> There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking at uh, our, you know, on the home court at uh, the CMC. Um, yeah, so today I want to tell you about um, some, on some ongoing work uh, that you can read about in, in these papers that I've written here, these archive numbers, um, with my Brilliant co-authors, Yifan Wang, Sue Lichtman, Netanel Lindner, Addie Stern, and Erez Berg. There's also um, a new Simons collaboration about uh, this topic. So I also just want to give a broad uh, overview to the kind of things that we're thinking about. And please ask questions. Uh, there's there's some there's some um, there's some mathematical, uh, you know, complexities in the topic, and you're uh, welcome to ask me about those to clarify anything, and also some some physical applications. So, if you're a mathematician, you want me to clarify those, uh, feel free as well. So, for the purpose of this talk, I mean, people have used this word categorical symmetry to mean different things, but here I'll just I'll just say it means that we have uh, quantum field theory, and it has a symmetry described by category, or we say that there's a category acting as a symmetry. And I'll tell you what that means, why we feel like it's a good thing to study. I'll give you a lot of examples, because the well, there there is a general there are general ways of describing these things, but I'd say they're incomplete. So I'm going to focus on examples. I'll tell you a little bit about the the, the part of the general description that we understand, which involves this bulk boundary correspondence, ideas like anomaly inflow, gauging, the classification of gap phases, things that we like to do with ordinary symmetries. We know how to do a little bit of that here. So hopefully that convinces you even more that this is like a theory of symmetry. And then I'll end with even more examples if I get to it. So we'll see. There's, there's a lot I could cover. So the starting very sort of philosophical, um, the, the simplest notions of symmetry are tied to transformations. So we might imagine that we have some, some kind of, let's see, I'm gonna figure out how I, how I can gesture here. Can you see my cursor if I do that? Ah, good, good. So we have something like, uh, configuration space of our system, say, M, and a group acting on it such that it preserves the equations of motion. So in classical mechanics, or in Hamiltonian mechanics, more specifically, what that looks like is that M is a symplectic manifold. G acts, so M is like phase space, your positions and momenta, and G acts by symplectomorphisms. And to specify the equations of motion, we need to specify a Hamiltonian, which is just a real function on this space. And the equations of motion are given by Hamiltonian flow with respect to uh, the symplectic structure. And the statement that we have the symmetry is just that this uh, Hamiltonian is G invariant. Now, in nice circumstances, um, for instance, if, if G is, is a Lie group, then we might ask for something more. We might ask that this is uh, what's called a Hamiltonian group action, which means that there's this, that there's a so-called moment map or momentum map Q, which is another real value function on M, which generates the action by Hamiltonian flow, but with respect to this Q. 
And Q automatically is conserved in the sense that the time derivative of Q is zero. So the, the way to see that is that the, the time derivative of Q is given by the Poisson bracket of the Hamiltonian and Q. And this vanishes because this is also the same thing as uh, the variation of the Hamiltonian with respect to Hamiltonian flow generated by Q. So the fact that Q generates a symmetry and that Q is conserved are actually the same statement. And that's, uh, that's called Noether's theorem. Okay, but you don't always have this. You don't, you don't always have a, a moment map, but actually in quantum mechanics, you do. So in quantum mechanics, things are a little bit more, uh, uh, they're a little bit more different. <laughs> the M is going to be, you know, pro uh, this projective uh, Hilbert space. So you know, non-zero states in, in, a, in some Hilbert space. And our, Hamilt our equation of motion is going to be the Schrodinger equation. So now the Hamiltonian is some, is some operator on this Hilbert space. And if we want to specify a group action on M, what we have to do is we have to just choose a unitary representation of our group on the Hilbert space. So I'll, I'll take G. If G is compact, it's automatically unitary. Anyway, this is how a group can act on a Hilbert space. And the statement that we have a symmetry is just that uh, for every element of the group, the unitary operator corresponding to that element commutes with the Hamiltonian. And you can see that from the, from the Schrodinger equation because it acts on side by left multiplication. And to show that this is invariant, you just need to use this commutation relation. So again, if we have a, if we have a Lie group, then this has a, a little bit of a simpler form which is every, every element of the group can be written as the exponential of some Lie algebra generators with some parameters theta. And if we apply rho to this, it's also, it's also um, the exponential of some permission operators Q on Hilbert space. So these Q, they're observables because they're permission. So they're things that you can measure. And the statement that H commutes with rho G now is that H commutes with the, the Qs, these you know, like charges. And by the, if you look at this uh, Schrodinger equation or you work in this like Heisenberg picture, you see this commutator is the same thing as the time derivative of Q. So once again, the, the fact that Q generates a symmetry and the fact that we have, uh, the fact that Q generates a symmetry is equivalent to the statement that Q is conserved in the sense that dQ dt is zero. So this is Noether's theorem, but this time you don't have to assume a uh, Hamiltonian action. It's really built into the, it's really built into the laws of quantum mechanics. In classical, now we want to go to field theory. So our first, first bit of classical field theory. So in that case, our configuration space M is something like sections over space or space time X. Here it's space because I'm writing the Hamiltonian. And what you write is some, some functional, some local functional of say phi is the section here. So it depends only on phi of X and the derivatives of phi at X. And then that integrated over all of space defines your energy. And you can use, or sometimes, and you can use Hamiltonian equations for this to get some PDEs for phi, or sometimes people work in terms of this, uh, this Lagrangian framework. But anyway, if you, if you do the Noether theorem, uh, if you look at the classical Noether theorem, symmetries that come from Hamiltonian or yeah, actions on the, on the fibers give rise to charge densities now. So we still have, we have these conserved charges Q, but now moreover, they're, they're integrals of local densities. This Q of phi is some shorthand for something like this. And we have it a little bit stronger. Uh, not only is uh, 
d big q dt zero, but actually uh, d little q dt is the divergence of some vector field, which we call the current. And this is this is really just the Poincaré lemma. So this is some local conservation law. So this is a bit stronger. And this is the thing we're going to think about generalizing. So this uses locality in a strong way, right? The fact that everything is an integral of some local quantity. So we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna be encoding locality in how we generalize um, this conservation law. Okay, so if we, if we pass to space time, so we take X maybe times time, or it doesn't matter what the global structure of, of space time is, we can, we can collect Q and this vector field J into a D minus one form, where big D is the space-time dimension. And I'll, I'll abuse notation now, and, and I'll just write uh, QJ as J, because I'm not, I'm not gonna split it into these components anymore. And it turns out that this conservation law is just the fact that this D minus one form is closed. So this D is the exterior derivative. And what this means is if we integrate J along any D minus one cycle Y, any closed hypersurface Y, this quantity only depends on the topology of Y or, or on, more specifically on the homology class of Y in space time. So we call these topological operators. So they're extended objects that, that we can measure. And actually the fact that this is topological is equivalent, if you think about Poincaré duality, it's, it's equivalent to the conservation law. So the, the fact, so, so now we've, we've gone another step. So we said we had, we had uh, having a symmetry is the same as having a conservation law. Now having a conservation law is the same as having a topological operator. And we like this frame, we like, we like this framing of, of the idea of symmetry because we want to say that symmetries are topological operators. Here I called them defects. Defects will just mean operator. Don't worry about that. The point is that in, in quantum field theory, if we think about it as class as, uh, as quantizing some classical field theory, then maybe it makes sense to think in terms of transformations of the fields. But actually, quantum field theories can usually be described in many different ways. There are dualities. There might even not be a classical limit, so that we might not even have a starting point. So it's ambiguous to talk about transformations acting on the fields. Um, it's unambiguous to talk about transformations acting on space time, but it is ambiguous if you want to describe more intricate symmetries. The thing that's unambiguous is to just ask about the set of topological operators. So that's why we're gonna to study topological operators as the definition of a symmetry. And so let's look at some examples. So the, one of the simplest classical field theories we can think about is, is a theory of a field phi, which is a map from space-time to the circle. So I'll call this the S1 compact boson. And you can express a action. Well, there's many actions you can write, of course, but one very simple action is this quadratic one that is basically the, the norm squared of the derivative of phi. We write it in form language as this d phi star d phi, star is Hodge star. And this theory has a number of symmetries. One obvious symmetry is that because this action only depends on the derivative of phi, you see there's a rotational symmetry. You can rotate the circle, it doesn't change the action. And the current associated to this symmetry is star d phi. You can show why that is by doing canonical quantization. You find some commutation relation that says that this current generates the transformation and it's conserved in the sense that D of this current, so D star D phi is zero, which is actually the equation of motion uh, of this action. 
So that's, that's the obvious symmetry, but there's, there's another conserved current that you can write, which is d phi. So if, if we're in two space-time dimensions, this is also a conserved one form, uh, d of this, what I call the winding current, and you'll see why, is zero just because d squared is zero. So it's kind of conserved for topological reasons. But if you look at the, if you look at the canonical computation relations, you find that it doesn't actually act on any observable that you can write as a function of phi. So you might say it's not a symmetry because it doesn't act on the fields, but I'll show you some operators where I'll try to convince you that it is a symmetry. Um, so actually at first glance, you might think that it's a trivial operator, right? Because, because J is D phi, you might think that, um, well, it's exact, except that phi is circle valued. So actually the integral of D phi around um, closed loops in general has to be an integer and especially for non-contractible loops, that integer, that can be uh, any integer. It, it computes the winding number of phi. So along a contractible loop, you'd think that the winding number is zero if phi is smooth, but actually in situations where you might like to study this field theory, phi typically has singularities. And what those singularities are is actually another operator that we can define in this theory. The way we define it is, is we, we choose some, some co-dimension two submanifold. So maybe, maybe we're in two dimensions. So we, we choose a point and we remove that point. Maybe we remove a small neighborhood of that point. And then we impose boundary conditions so that the field phi winds around these. So these operators are called vortices in this context because, uh, well, they, they look like this. Um, so there's kind of like a, you can see the winding of the, I've drawn phi as a vector field here. Um, you can see they wind around here. These things actually occur in systems. This is, a, this is a picture of some vortices in a superconductor, which is partially described by this field theory. So we'd like to include these objects in our theory. And there's a, the strong reason why is that there's actually a duality. If we're in two space-time dimensions, then we can write everything in terms of, we've, we've written the theory in terms of phi, we can rewrite everything in terms of some dual circle valued field phi tilde that actually is on a different circle with uh, roughly one over the radius of the original circle. And the relation between these two fields well, we can't relate the fields directly, but we can relate their currents. And they're related by this equation. So, so d phi, the winding current of phi, is the rotation current star d tilde phi of the dual field. And what this means is that the vortex of phi, which is a weird kind of operator where you have to introduce the singularity, is actually just e to the i tilde phi in the dual variables. So in this dual description, you kind of exchange which, which symmetry is hidden, which symmetry is manifest. So no, if you just have the theory, if you're just thinking about the set of observables and the Hilbert space and everything, you don't know whether it was described in terms of phi or tilde phi, because the theories are exactly equivalent. So the only complete description includes both of these, both of these uh, symmetries. These are two U1 symmetries. And then I'll say that you may as well, in dimensions that are not two, where d phi is, is still a one form, but now star d phi is a d minus one form, we'll still like to consider this as a symmetry, except it's going to be a higher form symmetry. Okay, so gauge theories are, are a rich source of similar examples. Um, for instance, if we look at the Maxwell equations for electrodynamics, in the absence of any charged matter, then actually the, the whole equations reduce to some sub, to a pair of conservation laws, which is if we if we write this field strength tensor F, so this is a two form, which is dA. If you write the gauge field as A, the Maxwell equations are dF equals zero, which is again follows from d squared equals zero, 
and d star f equals zero. And those are the whole equations. So we can think about f and star f as two conserved two forms. And there are topological operators associated with them where you just integrate, you exponentiate and integrate the currents over some closed surfaces, sigma. So there's two surface operators. And surface operators are going to act on lines. The idea is that if you have a, if you have some line operator, so this is a line in four dimensions. So it's it's wrapped by there's some there's some surface which links it, and so the way that these symmetries act is that you write the surface operator on the surface and you and you you link you link it around a line operator, and then you try to pull it off and you see what you get. So the well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the if you look at the canonical commutation relations, you can figure out what these do to the fields. And actually, this one, like before, it doesn't do anything. But the second one shifts a by a flat connection. And you can think about this flat connection as being like Poincaré dual to the surface. And therefore, it acts. The second one here acts on the Wilson lines. So if you write this, this operator, which is you know, computes the Arnold Baum phase around some curve gamma, that when we shift by lambda, this integral can shift. We can get a phase here. So if you think about this wrapping, same thing. So this one acts on these Wilson observables. But like before, the first one doesn't act on any function that you can actually write in A. Instead, it acts on some kind of singularities. It, in this case, it acts on monopoles. So you can define a monopole by, again, you take, you take some curve and you remove, you remove a neighborhood of it. So the boundary of this neighborhood is S2 times S1. And around this S2, you impose the boundary condition that the magnetic flux through S2 or this dA is two pi. So it's really analogous to the vortices. And if you just look at this, uh, look at this um, operator, then this f is going to see this 2 pi. And so this is uh, this df equals 0 current is going to act on these monopole operators. And there's an electric magnetic duality, just like before, that uh, exchanges the two of them. So we need to include both if we want to have a complete description of the symmetries of the theory. So there's also non-abelian generalizations people have studied. There, you don't usually have as many symmetries. So for instance, if you have Yang-Mills theory, um, again, without matter, let's just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We can have matter for this example. Um, with a non-simply connected gauge group, so there's some pi one of the gauge group G, then we can define we can define some topological surface operators given any map from the fundamental group to U one. And the way that works is uh, given such a map, it defines a it defines a class in H two G, which is just something that we can express uh, in terms of the gauge field and integrate over some surface. So this would be some integral over some sigma. And the monopoles in such a theory are labeled by elements of the fundamental group. And you can see these pair. So the, the action of a map from pi 1 to g on a monopole labeled by some element in pi 1 of g is just the image of the element here in u1. One second, I'm going to let in some light. All right, good. So there are more dualities that relate uh, that relate these these two examples. I already mentioned there's this electric magnetic duality in oops in three plus one dimensions, which exchanges f and star f, and it also exchanges uh, Wilson lines or charges with monopoles. There's also particle vortex duality in two plus one dimensions. So 
So Maxwell theory in two plus one dimension is actually equivalent to this uh, S1 compact boson. And the relation is that star F is, is now the winding symmetry, tilde phi. And to just reiterate in general, we expect the set of topological operators is the well-defined invariant of the quantum field theory, not the symmetry transformations of the fields. So now this part will be a little bit mathematical. We want to ask, how could we describe, or maybe I should pause like if there are any questions. Okay, maybe not, maybe it's too basic so far. Okay, so how do we describe the set of topological operators? So let's think about topological lines in two space-time dimensions because it's definitely the simplest. So we'll say that every line carries some label, but moreover, when we have two lines, we can, we can, think, about, we can think about point junctions. So topological point operators that could be inserted as a junction between lines A and B. And I want to consider these as, as a morphism from A and B. So in the sense of category theory, what you do is you just take these labels and then between any pair of labels A and B, you, you include a set called Ha maybe of morphisms between them. So the set will be some, will be some vector space here. And so we're gonna have a category, but there's some extra data from fusion and if we have two lines, we have two lines A and B, and we bring them very close together, this becomes some, it looks like just one line. And so we can ask what line does it look like? In general, it looks, it maybe looks like a sum of lines. Okay, so this gives you some, some fusion coefficients. So there's, there's, there's fusion rules here. So we say that A times B is an A. So A includes uh, also sums of labels. And actually the, in this structure of a, of a category, we can think about, we think about not just this way of expressing fusion, but if we think about the Hom space of A tensor B into C or A times B into C, that means junctions. So what are those like? Those are like junctions. Here's A times B and here's C. There are junctions like this. Oh, sorry. There are junctions. And if we spread A and B apart, there are three-way junctions between A, B, and C. So we find that just including fusion and including these, these point junctions, we actually are allowed to study uh, networks, arbitrary networks of topological lines, as long as there's something in this, in this Hom space. As long as there's some junction we can put here, then we can study the, this network. And this will also be a topological object, like we can move these things around in our theory. So there's one more bit of data, which is the, because of my bunch of names, um, I'll call it the F symbol. It's also called the crossing relation or the 6J symbol, maybe even the Pockner move. This is a way of, so once we have our network formed of these lines and these junctions, if we have a piece of that network, which looks like this, then we can replace it with, we can replace that piece with pieces that look like this. So notice that the, I've colored them so that the, the lines going into the boundary are all the same, but now we go from some like S channel to T channel type thing where we had some line C going across here. We don't have C anymore. Instead, we have a sum uh, over other lines which fit here, C prime. And we should also sum over these junctions and have some coefficients called the F symbols, which I, here I just write F, it has lots of uh, indices that, that uh, 
contain this relation. So the reason why this relation is true is that if you take if you take a piece of you can you can actually glue these two pictures together and put that in the plane and that is a diagram with with nothing you know that's completely contained in the in like a disk and if we look at that if we if we think about shrinking that it looks like a point operator and in our theory we want to assume that there are no it's going to be a topological point operator right because the whole thing is topological. We want to assume that there are no topological, non-trivial topological point operators, because those are like those are like operators which have a VEV. So you can you can measure them or you can you can diagonalize them and reduce to this case where there are no non-trivial topological operators, which means that it just must be some number once you have this little bubble. And then that in locality implies that you can do it in, in any piece of the diagram. So for this already happens for ordinary symmetries. So in, in the case of symmetry groups, what we have are networks of lines. So here's still two dimensions, networks, networks of lines labeled by elements of the group. And now the fusion rule is just that two lines can fuse if the two group elements multiply to the third. So if you think about this as a, you can think about this as a gauge field and saying that they're, they're in, it's, it's a flat G gauge field. There's no singularity here. There's no flux at this point, which means if you go around it, you get the identity, right? So if you multiply these labels in any closed loop, a closed contractible loop, you should get the identity. And there's a crossing relation. And the crossing relation actually encodes, encodes the hoof anomaly of the theory. And you can guess that by counting, uh, counting the number of labels involved here, this whole thing is determined by four G labels, just the ones on the boundary, right? Because this label in the middle is determined by these two, by the group multiplication, same here. And that gives you an element in the third group cohomology of G. And this is the, yeah, this is the hoofed anomaly. So the F symbol is the same kind of thing, but we're going to have a slightly different notion of anomaly uh, when we get to it. Good. So this data that I just told you, the data of the category with its fusion product and this F symbol gives A the structure of what's called a monoidal category. And this category, well, this structure is very analogous if you want to think about, say you want to study like the category of two-dimensional quantum field theories. How could you do that? One way to define a morphism between quantum field theories is to say that you have a topological defect between them, right? So we could have theory A, theory B, and some morphism would be a topological uh, interface where they meet. Then there would be a map, right? Like if you had any operator in B, you could wrap it by this interface and get an operator in A and vice versa. So, If you do this, then this is actually going to be a two category because you can have you can have interfaces between interfaces. So here is here is a morphism between A to B. Here's another morphism from A to B. And then this junction is a morphism between these morphisms. So there's some two category of two-dimensional quantum field theories, if you think this way. In general, in general, you can keep going, right? If we, if we had, oh, whoops, sorry. Oh no, sorry about that. In general, you can keep going. I wanted to draw something new anyway, where you have theories A and B. Um, now I'm drawing them as 3D theories. 
now you can have junctions between interfaces and then junctions on those junctions. So this, this would be like a three category. So in general, we say something like, this is a slogan. I don't know how to say this precisely, but the, the D space time dimensional quantum field theories form some kind of D category. And the way we can think about A, uh, this is curly A, sorry. All right, so the way, the way we think about this, uh, this structure of the topological defects, well, to do that, we just have to put, we just have to put A on both sides of these pictures. And we see that what we're really describing is endomorphisms of this theory inside this D category. And in general, uh, endomorphisms of an object in a D category form some kind of monoidal D minus one category with product given by composition. Yes, Wenji, you have a question? Yeah, several examples you talked about before is um, continuous symmetries like the continuous U1 symmetry, the winding continuous U1 symmetry. How well is it to use the categories in terms of these fusion data and app symbols to describe those cases? That's a great question. Yeah, so what, what, I'm, what I'm describing here, so you can definitely think about topological defects and they will satisfy these rules. But it's hard to say, I don't know how to say mathematically what sort of category you get. The mathematics is a lot easier if you only have a finite set of topological defects. But of course, it makes sense if you're studying this group case to, to take the labels to be even in a Lie group. It's fine. You just have to be careful about what this cohomology is. Is some kind of measurable cohomology. So my answer is, I think it works. I don't know how to do it. G here yeah, actually usually decrease, uh, discrete symmetry, right? Even for U1, it doesn't. No, I think it's fine. You can do something like this. You get, uh, there's, there's some omega you can write here. There are some crossing relations. What if you're running into some defect lines, intersections with two defect lines, one coming from the continuous U1, the other coming from this, uh, winding U1 symmetry. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's when you would get something like this because that because it comes from the tip anomaly. Mm, what would they fuse fusing to? Still a composite, right? What they fuse into? Yeah, you have to uh, you have to make some choices there that will give you a a cocycle representative of omega. So there's some so ambiguity here and choices you have to make that I think uh, you have to, for instance, you would have to choose, like you want to define the, the winding and momentum line together, then you have to, you know, there's some co-orientation of these lines and maybe some convention is like, you put the winding line here, you put the, you put the rotation line here. Mm -hmm. And okay. then, you'd, then you'd be worried about, you know, when your fusion involves them crossing versus when it doesn't involve them crossing. And that's when you would get uh, these interesting F symbols. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. So for, with group cohomology, you can still describe it in terms of like co-cycles, like for, for mm -hmm. continuous groups, right? It's just that physically you need to in, impose this measurability condition or whatever it is on the co-cycles. So it's just an extra right. condition you place to from physical reasons. So I assume it would be something similar in the more general case, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. So this this omega, what, what Dominic is referring to is this is that for continuous groups, this omega is usually not even continuous, but there is some version of cohomology where you study measurable co-cycles on the group and that gives the right answer. It's not exactly clear why they should be measurable, maybe because you want to be able to integrate over the gauge group or something. Okay. Are any so I'm uh, sorry, can I ask yeah. another question? So the I mean, when you're describing topological order, you would use like a, a fusion category, but maybe that's too strong of a requirement here because like fusion category has finitely many objects and maybe you don't want to impose that. I mean, we were just talking about continuous groups. So I guess you probably don't want to impose that, right? Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about the fusion category example when we when we get to bulk boundary correspondence because there you can really think about this, uh, this TQFD. But yeah, in general, I would like to know how to do that. I don't know how to do it. 
but so there is some structure you want maybe between because you you want monoidal category but then with some linear structure right like that's part of the definition of fusion category uh yeah maybe you just want a fusion category but i dropped the condition that you have finitely many simple objects and then i add some kind of measurability condition for all of the data i'm not sure i don't know if anyone studied that i never i haven't found it uh, and also is there some unitarity condition you want to impose like actually unitarity is not important here i think uh all you need this thing to satisfy is like the Pentagon equation. Well, so in the case of just a group, you probably want your group to act unitarily on the theory, don't you? For physical reasons, at least. Yeah, so that's automatic for compact groups. So maybe if you want to study non-compact, then you do need to impose some things. I see, thanks. But this this might this structure is uh, is likely interesting even for non-unitary theories. So yeah, I don't want to I don't want to fit unitarity into this. I just want to describe like the algebraic structure of the operators. But Ryan, yes. Um, for if when, when, if you discuss bulk boundary correspondence, do you need to require your category to be unitary? So the bulk okay. category, I guess, will automatically be unitary, will be like a unitary braided fusion category if you start with the fusion category on the boundary. This is like the boundary category. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Yes, so this is the kind of structure I want to describe. Now for invertible operators, we can, we can describe this um, somewhat simply, or at least we can, we can describe it, period. Um, which is if, if, all of our, if all of our line operators have an inverse line, which so far in all of examples they have, such that the, the product of the two lines is just an invisible line, which I call one, then this, this category is, de is described what's called, by, what's called uh, a D group or a D groupoid with one object. It's essentially, it's a, it's a sequence, it's D groups. Um, and here, so pi one is any, any, any group. And uh, the rest of these are abelian groups. And the last one is U1. This is where the F symbol is going to live. And the idea here is that you should think about pi n. So the, so the nth group in this sequence is the group of co-dimension n topological operators, right? So the, these guys form a group and they form a group in, in, every, uh, in every dimension. So that's where the sequence of group, groups come from. So if we have an ordinary symmetry, then those give us co-dimension one topological operators. And so there, this whole thing just collapses to a group in degree one. We still have this element in degree uh, D, this U1 in degree D, I'll say more about. Um, if, we have, if we have three plus one D Maxwell theory, remember there were two, there were two topological surface operators, which are co-dimension two. They each generate a U1 group. There was a U1 parameter. And so there, all of the data is in pi two, which is U1 times U1. And in two plus one D Maxwell theory, or equivalently this, this uh, S1 compact boson, there was the rotation symmetry, which is an ordinary symmetry, giving us a U1 in degree one. And there was this winding symmetry, which acts on, which defines a topological line operator, which is co-dimension two. So we have a U1 in degree two. So generally you can have things in all degrees. And there's also this extension data, which is important. Uh, it's kind of hard to say what it is. Um, 
sorry, this slide is like very strange for the physicists. Um, but the, the easiest way to describe it, in my view, is, is to think of it topologically. We basically have, a, we have an iterated fiber bundle, which is made out of these eilenberg mclean spaces. So, so this space, k, k pi n, in general, is, is, a, is a space who, which is connected. And its nth homotopy group is, or in this case, this first homotopy group is this first group pi 1a. And then the other ones are, are 0. So the way we build this, this fiber bundle is we start with k pi 1, 1 as our first space. And then we need to specify a, a fiber bundle over it whose fiber is now the k pi 2 a 2. And so this, this is going to be classified by some group cohomology element of pi 1 with coefficients in pi 2. And there's going to be a third stage if you have a third group there and so on. And you go all the way up to the last stage. Remember, I said the last group you have is u1. And there, the extension, we still have the extension data. That's essentially encoding our f symbol. So all of this is like the rules for composing junctions. So sometimes people like to take the object up to d minus 1 and call that the symmetry group. Here, it's natural to include the last step where you also include the f symbol, which is the data, which is part of the data of this category. And so that's, that's also equivalent to the of anomaly in this uh, D group case. So just like the ordinary group case, the last extension here, which is basically giving you some U1 coefficient class and degree D plus one classifying this last extension is, uh, is equivalent to the of anomaly of the theory. Here it's built into the data of the symmetry. So Brian, um, am I correct that physically the last one just means that we add a D form background gauge fields and integrate it over all space time. So it's not tautological U1 D form symmetry. Yeah, so the way, the, way I, the way I described it, the, these uh, pi D is the group of co-dimension D topological operators. So these are the point operators. Right, but the gauge so they're just they're just will, numbers. Right, but the corresponding gauge fields will be a D form. Uh, well, I don't usually want to do that, but you can do that. I mean, all it's doing is adding some phase factors in your in your partition function, if you like. You can do that if you want. I think what Shu Heng is saying is that this is the way it arises in string theory when you couple two braids. Yeah. I okay. Anyway, understand that, that comment. <laughs> it sounds intriguing. Yeah. So the, the reason why I want to keep this as part of the of the symmetry data is that when we go to categories, you really can't. There's no trivial choice for most categories. So the f symbol is just part of the data, and the anomaly comes from somewhere else. So I'll talk about that in engaging it if I get to it. Okay. So for instance, in the ordinary symmetry group. Just to just to recap, why you get the why you get the cross simulation or the Hooft anomaly is uh, that this here you only have one step in this iterated vibration. You go all the way from degree one to degree, to degree d in one fell swoop, and such a bundle is classified by a map to the next eilenberg mclean space. This is some fun fact about these guys that bundles with their fiber are easy to classify, and such a map is equivalent to a element in the d plus first cohomology of g which is what we would normally um, consider as the as the anomaly of g in a d-dimensional theory so that's part of the extension data for maxwell theory there's also a non-trivial extension so here d is four and we're, all, we're only going from we're going from degree two now directly to degree four is classified by a map to KU1 uh, in the fifth degree. And from the canonical commutation relations, there's actually a mixed anomaly between uh, these two U1s. And it turns out that the element in H5 that classifies this bundle is this mixed 
Chern Simon's term, where, where B and B E and B M are two forms that couple to these uh, couple to these symmetries. Let's see, do I have another example? Yeah, those are the two examples of that. So you can you can ignore the extension data um, if you want. <laughs> Just remember that it's there. So. Now I want to talk a little bit about non-invertible topological operators. So that was that was the story of invertible ones, which I feel like we understand very well, and we're motivated to uh, study them. The non-invertible ones seem a little bit more exotic. Like, why do we want to include them? Well, because we're we've set out to study all topological operators. I feel like that's a good reason to include them. But more precisely. Again, these non-invertible topological operators, they'll also be preserved by things like dualities. So if we want to check dualities, it's useful to know that, they're, that all of the topological operators uh, are in bijection on both sides. And moreover, if we have a renormalization group flow, so if we, if we start with say uh, our UV fixed point and we add some symmetric perturbation, we're here symmetric, has a special meaning for, for general operators, which is that if we, if we have our operator O and we have our, we have our defect, still I'm drawing two dimensional pictures, but you can imagine that this is like some, some hypersurface in general, that if we bring O through the defect, that it amounts to some numerical factor. So this is some piece of a correlation function. So we get some numerical factor in front of the whole correlation function. And the statement that it's symmetric is that this factor is just positive. So if we have such a perturbation and we do renormalization group flow, this operator will remain topological. And actually the whole data of this monoidal category, so this is curly A, will be preserved, which is some kind of Tuft anomaly matching. Yes, there's a question from Davide. Hi, so why is it okay to have R of these not one? Yes, good. So it doesn't have to be one <laughs> for these non-invertible lines. Um, for instance, usually you get a factor of say like the quantum dimension or something like that, right? Like uh, I'll talk a little bit. Yeah, my next example is Kramer's Vonier duality, which satisfies which satisfies a rule like this. And if you look at the eigenvalues of such an operator, then the eigenvalues are, are zero or they're plus or minus square root two. So in general, you get some factor here. But that Ryan, is, uh, when you yeah, define this eigenvalues, namely square root two, et cetera, I thought it's defined okay. as defined by encircling the operator. By yeah, the second value is not the same as R, right? If I, I mean, the identity clearly commutes to operators, but uh, that's like- Yeah, okay, that's true. R equal to one, clearly. So sigma passing to an identity would not give me square root of two. That's right. Think. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So sorry about that. And I was, uh, I was confused. Maybe we can just take R equals one here. I was actually thinking about the encircling. Because otherwise, if you turn on O on one side, it means that on the side you're turning on R times O. So it, 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 you get the domain world between the two at different values of the coupling. Yes, that's true. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Uh, there are some more questions. Uh, Meng? Ryan, so uh, by looking at this picture, are you implying that by moving a local operator, across this, this line, it still remains a local operator? Yes, that's important. Uh, is that always the case? No, it's not always the case. I'm gonna give you an example where it's not the case in a second, but, but we, need that, we need that to uh, make some kind of like RG matching argument. Okay, so this applies to those operators that remain local. Yeah, this is just my definition of what it means to have a symmetric operator. Okay, okay, all right, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, good. So let's let's give an example where um, maybe the simplest example where you have some non-invertible operator. 
which is this uh, critical icing point in one plus one dimension. So it, it can be expressed in a spin chain model like this, where X and Z are, are Pauli X and Z operators on some uh, chain of spin one halves labeled by integers. And there's a, there's a non-local transformation of these Pallys where you send X to a string of Zs and you send Z to a pair of Xs. You can see these still satisfy the, uh, the same commutation relations. And this transformation ends up just exchanging these two terms. So this Hamiltonian is symmetric under this weird transformation. And well, it's equivalent to saying that this theory is, uh, is unchanged if you are to gauge this Z2 symmetry, this is Z2 symmetry generated by the product of Zs. If you gauge that symmetry, do some gauge fixing, it amounts to this transformation. And this transformation, it's not, uh, it's not an invertible symmetry because it doesn't preserve the set of local operators. So the reason why that is, is that if we think again about uh, a little piece of a correlation function here, where we have this purple line is our, is our kramers ronier transformation. And here, this is uh, just any operator, or maybe this is actually a general picture, um, that as we bring this line past the point, this relates to Meng's question, to figure out what it does, we pinch off a little bubble here. And then in this region, we can use the crossing relation. And if we use the crossing relation, it doesn't just pinch off. We have to sum over the lines that connect here. And in general, this is in, sorry, not A tensor, A inverse, A tensor, A dual. This is some sum over lines in this transformation is a Z2 transformation. So in this case, it would be sum over lines in the square of the kramers ronier transformation. If I call that sigma, then the result of acting on X, so if, so if this is X, in the end, we're gonna get some string of, we're gonna get some string of Zs here. That's supposed to be like this string of Zs. And then maybe once we pop this bubble, we just get the identity. So we know that the square of sigma has to include epsilon, but there's also operators that uh, are unchanged. So it also has to include the trivial line. And with a little more work, we convince ourselves that this must be the fusion rule. So it's not invertible. Ryan. Yes. Are you in non-compact space or is space compact? This is just supposed to be a piece of a correlation function. I mean, there are so things that you, that you have to do out here so that it's not zero. Yeah, my question is about the first line in the slide. This the first no, the, the first line with the equation, because this line, the yeah, quality that you present is 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 okay as, as you wrote it in non-compact space, but in compact space, you need to also the model is not self-dual. You need to add a Z two gauge theory. I agree. Yeah. And that's, that's the statement that, uh, well, it's, it can be self dual Like there are self dual boundary conditions of this theory, but the usual ones that you would choose like free boundary are not self dual Well, won't that make a difference here? Um, no, I think that's fine. In general, we expect there to be symmetric and non-symmetric boundary conditions. But the, the theory doesn't have that symmetry. Yeah, but that's a, just a statement about what boundary condition you choose. Like if we just want to study the bulk theory, then it's fine to think about this non-compact space and say that, okay, maybe you can compactify. You just have to fix things at the edge. Believe me that you can fix things <laughs> if you really have to. No, I, I, know what, I know what you're doing. I think I understand this point, but I'm concerned that you have a symmetry. You will like to argue that you should think of it as a symmetry which is so depends so crucially on these boundary conditions specifically yeah yes, but that's just saying that that like normally, when, normally when we have periodic boundary conditions 
the symmetries do not depend on the boundary conditions. And that's not the case here. Yeah, but yeah, okay. So that's that's something interesting about the symmetry, but in general, I think you should just say that. So you do have a topological operator here in periodic boundary conditions. You just have to think a little bit harder about how you do this transformation. Right, but that, that, that's exactly my point. No, it's clear that what you're doing is correct. I'm just questioning to what extent all the details are appropriate. Yeah, let's say that there's some modification that you have to do here for, yeah, you probably can't just write this equals sign if you have periodic boundary conditions, I'll agree. Right, and this will have various consequences down, down the slide. Mm -hmm. I mean, thermodynamicality is not does not map, map the theory to itself. To to I mean, right, it is not a requires you to gauge gauges it true before you can do it. Right. So. Yeah. Well, I'm saying that here, the theory is self dual under gauging Z two. I mean, it's Z two orbifold is is equivalent to itself, and that's where this line is coming from. You can actually derive that from this fusion. But this Z two. There is a Z2 that you can get, but it's not this one. The Z2 that you can gauge is, is the product of these Zs. Right, this is a true symmetry of the model. Yeah. The one that you're talking about is not a standard symmetry. If you want to, yeah, this gives you some uh, non-invertible symmetry. I guarantee you that if you study non-compact space and you look at the action on local operators of this transformation, you'll get the same rules as studying this line, say in like a rational conformal field theory, like this That's is the line. This is a correct statement. Shouldn't you really define a symmetry to be the existence of these lines? Yeah, like... that's what I that's what I do. So here this is just to this is just to remind you maybe a little bit about Kramer's Ronyer transformation. I just wanted to remind you that some local operators get sent to non-local operators to argue why there should be this string here. I could have argued from CFT. Uh, I wonder whether this thing happens if and only if the issue depends on, on the boundary conditions. Because for standard symmetries, you don't have that subtlety. That sounds intuitive because this is basically mapping uh, to some twisted sector. So That's correct. That so sounds, you have to that sounds right. the line that is attached to the operator after the map. Yes. I think that's a fair assessment. There's a question from Lazij. Sorry, I don't know his name. Can you explain how is how are correlation, correlation functions with this Kramer's vanilla line defined? Um, yes. So there's a number of ways to define them. Um, here, one way to do it is to you start with you start with some some correlation function in your theory, and then you draw the. Let's see. Let me say. Um, I don't know if I should give you the the CFT answer, but so in the in the CFT answer, what this is is you can express the theory as a as a slab where you have you have the chiralizing you have one chiral half on one side, and you have the the other chiral half on the other side, and in between. You have this topological field theory that is actually described. It has the same fusion rules here. So, oops. So it has a it has a line with label sigma, and I didn't give myself enough dimensions to draw. But basically, if you insert that line here, so here's going into the page maybe. Uh, that if you put that line there, now that is going to be defining a correlation function for you, where you have. You, know, you have your other operator insertions, like here's here is an operator in the Ising theory. Does it make sense, like literally in the lattice model? Yeah. So in the lattice model, we can actually define 
well, we can define a few things. Um, one thing we can define is we, we, can, we can figure out what, how to express the defect, um, which would be a defect inserted along the time direction at some fixed point in space. The way we can do that on the lattice is actually pretty simple, which is we just take this transformation and we apply it to half the system. And we find that it only modifies, it only modifies Hamiltonian terms near here. And that's what defines the defect. And now you can put that on periodic boundary conditions. If you want to, you just have to do, you have to forget that you did it here. You just have to do that modification at one point on the circle. But in general, if you want the thing to twist around and stuff, I don't know how to define that on the lattice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so more about this. Um, so the order parameter is not symmetric. That, that was X here. It's not symmetric because it doesn't map to a local operator. According to our definition, it has to just pass through the line unchanged. And the other relevant operator in the theory is this thing, the energy operator, which here it's XX minus Z. This is the thing that, you know, it preserves the Z2 symmetry product of Zs. It tunes you between the ordered and disordered phase, the symmetry preserving and the symmetry breaking phase of the C2. And if you think about what this Kramer's Fonier transformation does, it actually exchanges those two phases. And so this operator can't be invariant because then those phases would be invariant, right? The symmetries would be preserved along the RG flow, but there's just not. So this is also not symmetric. So the Ising CFT is actually uh, totally stable perturbatively stable with this with the symmetry. But there are symmetric irrelevant operators. Like there's a dimension four one, it's actually TT bar, that if you if you give it enough, if you give it a large enough coefficient, so you do some large perturbation, you will eventually pass through some further critical point, which in this case is this central charge seven tenths theory called tricritical Ising. And then on the other side of that, we have, we have a phase with, with threefold ground state degeneracy. And that phase has the same categorical symmetry. The way you can think about it is if we, if we, include, if we include the energy operator and draw a two-dimensional phase diagram, so this is the energy operator direction and this is the, the, the this is some like four spin interaction or anything that's going to generate really anything other than this. Um, then you have the disordered phase and the ordered phase. And you see this, this gapped phase, which is stabilized by Kramer's Vanya duality. In the broader phase diagram, it looks like a first order transition between the ordered and disordered phases. And that's where it's three ground states come from. It's two from the ordered phase and one from the disordered phase. And the Kramer's Vanya duality is is permuting these ground states, right? Because it's sending the, it sends the disordered phase, phase ground state to like the sum of the ordered phase ground states. So here you might say that the, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Yes, Nati. Yeah, I'm questioning your statement about deforming icing by DT bar with a large coefficient. This is not mm -hmm. supposed to be a meaningful thing to do. Um, There's a bigger statement which is meaningful, which is starting from tricritical icing and deforming it appropriately, you flow into icing along a certain irrelevant operator. This that's is true. a statement, but the first one is not meaningful. Yeah, okay, you're right. I mean, if I exactly do TT bar, I don't want to do an integrable deformation here. I want to do something that's just like the leading term. That's just the most relevant symmetric operator, but I want to choose some general. Uh, some general symmetric perturbation. And then this is one of the things that can happen. But yeah, if you want to study this phase diagram, by far the way to do it is to look at the tricritical Ising CFD. And this has, this has this symmetry. It actually has an even larger categorical symmetry. And you can see that uh, it has one symmetric relevant operator, which with one sign tunes you to the Ising CFD, which the other sign tunes you to this gapped phase. This way of phrasing it, I think is correct. The other one is not correct. Mm -hmm. I think the, 
Okay, so we are in agreement. And Davide says this RG flow from tricritical to Ising is actually integrable. So that's cool. All right. Yeah, so. Actually also interesting for another reason because it, tricritical Ising is supersymmetric and mm -hmm. you can even preserve supersymmetry along the flow and then the fermion of Ising is the goldstone fermion of spontaneous breaking supersymmetry. Nice. <laughs> That sounds very cool. All right, so let's see. Um, yeah, are there any more questions about this example before I move on to something else? Maybe not. So um, in the last bit of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the bulk boundary correspondence. So this applies when we have a finite uh, set of topological lines that we're studying. Of course, we can always study if we have a finite set that's closed under the fusion product, then we can study that on its own. And those sorts of categorical symmetries occur naturally at the boundary of topological field theories. In particular, if, uh, if A is a fusion category, which is a monoidal category with duals and with finitely many semi-simple objects, then we can construct a state sum TQFT, so a TQFT with a very nice combinatorial partition function from this Trivero construction or Levin Wen if we want to construct a Hamiltonian. And intuitively, the partition function of this TQFT, it's a sum over networks. So, like the ones I drew before, again, where co dimension K submanifolds are going to be labeled by elements of pi K A because we don't have pi ka except in the invertible case, but still they're gonna be labeled by something in degree k. And in the group case, this is really just gonna be a uh, sum over g valued hypersurfaces. It's gonna be Poincaré dual to a flat gauge field. A more precise way to say what this all is, is that you have diagrams in the D category and you know, diagrams that are based at the theory that we're, that we're interested in, right? Where A is like endomorphisms at that objects. And we just study all of those diagrams which can be embedded into space time. So for a group, it really would be like choosing a triangulation and drawing arrows and labeling the arrows by group elements. So like you're used to. And there will be a bunch of zero dimensional junctions in this diagram or zero dimensional junctions in the, in the Poincaré dual of this diagram. So like this point here. And there, there will be some F symbol that we can, that because of the dimensionality, there will always be some F symbol associated to that point. And that gives us a number. And the product of all those numbers is the weight of the diagram. And the idea is that using the crossing relation, or not using the crossing relation, but using the conditions that the F symbol has to satisfy, for a fusion category, there are only finitely many topological classes of these diagrams. And by moving this network around, this becomes a finite sum. And let me say a little bit more about this weight. So here is a picture of a piece of three plus one D to arrive zero theory. So here on this tetrahedron, this is like where our diagram is. So we have these, these points are our objects and the, and the lines are one morphisms and the faces are two morphisms. So you can think about it that way, or you can think about it in terms of this, these surfaces. So these are, these are surfaces labeled by, labeled by objects in the category um, in A. So these, these, are, these are given by the line labels on the boundary. So they're co-dimension one on the boundary, they're co-dimension one in the bulk, so they're surfaces. And this is, uh, this is actually a generic uh, point defect of surfaces in three dimensions. And you can see there's, there's six labels here corresponding to the six edges of the tetrahedron, or they're also the six uh, little pieces of this. So this is the brown piece, this is the green piece, and there's four quadrants of the, of the orange plane. And so these are the, this, this is, these are what the point like junctions look like in the, in the 3D state sum. And to see where the F move is, what we do is we slice this with a plane 
and we look at the intersection with this plane. So it's this. So the, the plane we're going to slice with is this gray one, and the intersection is these black lines. And we see if we move this plane through the singularity, these uh, black lines at the top and bottom cross, and this amounts to amounts to an F symbol. And actually, something like this happens in all dimensions. And so that's why every point-like junction is hiding an F symbol. So we just take the F symbol uh, associated with this transformation, and that's the weight of this singularity in the state sum. So here's a proposition. Um, D-dimensional theories with categorical symmetry A. So A here is, is, is fusion. So like very nice, very finite, are in bijection with boundary theories of this state sum of, of this T of T, Tarai Vera theory, which is constructed from A. So one direction is easy. Uh, well, yeah, they're both easy. One direction is given a theory with, a, with categorical symmetry A, we can produce a boundary theory. We have to produce a boundary theory of the state sum. So basically all we have to do is we have to say what happens when these surfaces meet the boundary, and we'll say they just they just end on the topological operators. We assume this theory has some topological operators labeled by A, so the A surface ends on the A topological operator. And of course, the network, if we move the network uh, a little bit, um, then everything is topological. But there's one thing that we do have to check, which is that when, when these bulk point junctions passes through the boundary, that changes the state sum, right? The boundary has to compensate for that change. And again, we can look at this picture. So if we think about this as a movie of maybe the point junction starts uh, over here in front of the plane, let's say the, that the space in front of this plane is like the, where the TQFT lives and the boundary theory lives on the plane, on the, on the gray plane, then as this point junction passes through, right? As it passes through, the lines on the boundary do this little uh, crossing relation dance. And so we get, we lose, we lose the weight here in the state sum, but it's compensated by the F symbol in the boundary, in the boundary theory. So any correlation function is going to still be topological invariant. And so our state sum is still going to reduce to a finite sum. So it's a good boundary condition. Conversely, if I have a boundary theory, then we can do this construction where we make a slab. So we think about, uh, we think about our TQFT in the bulk of the slab. We put the boundary theory that we start with on one side. And then on the other side, we put this, this thing I call the Dirichlet boundary condition. And the way this Dirichlet boundary condition is defined is that, so in the, the bulk, we're summing over like these networks. And this boundary condition is just a simple boundary condition where we say the network is not allowed to end on the boundary. So that's a good boundary condition. Uh, no singularities can leave the bulk or anything like that. No point like junctions can leave the bulk. Everything's still topological. So that's a good boundary. Um, and that actually gives us a theory with, now we think about this direction as small, then we get some effective D-dimensional theory and that theory is going to have global categorical symmetry A. And uh, the way to see that is that basically we have to define some topological defects labeled by A. So if we have A, uh, little A and, and fancy A, we can define a topological defect by modifying the state sum so that, say, we always want an A line ending at a particular place or in an a, sur an a surface ending at a particular place on the boundary. So we impose and we modify the state sum as like an operator to change the boundary condition along some boundary network. And we see that this defines, right, these are going to satisfy the, the curly A fusion rules and everything. So this slab theory has the global symmetry that we wanted. So this is a converse. And actually these two are, inverse to each other. You can show that, but that's the bijection. So for example, in this very simple group-like case, so if we just take a, a group-like category built out of Z2 with 
no hoofed anomaly, then this derived zero state sum, we're summing over, we're summing over hypersurfaces labeled by Z2. So these are Z2D cycles in D plus one dimensions. In Poincaré duality, it's, a, it's the same thing as a Z2 one co-cycle, which is the same thing as a flat Z2 gauge field. So really what we're doing, this derived error theory is just Z2, it's just uh, topological Z2 gauge theory, Z2 digraph witten theory with no uh, twist. What we're saying here is that any theory with anomaly-free Z2 symmetry can be gauged. And that means it defines a good boundary condition for the gauge theory. And if we think about this Dirac-Schley boundary condition, what it's doing is it's setting, it's setting this gauge field A to zero, right? By saying there can be no lines that end here, we're saying that it's exact, it's, it's zero on the boundary. And so when we form this slab, it's, it's equivalent to just turning off the gauge field, which returns us to the original theory with the global Z2 symmetry. If you like, this is a lot like uh, this ungaging procedure because in, in the anion picture of this, of this phase, which is like torque code, you condense some charge anions to get this Dirichlet boundary condition. And that condensation of anions is, is uh, you can think of it as gauging the magnetic symmetry, if you like, just a technical point. Is there a question? Dominic, you raised your hand and then you didn't raise your hand. Oh, well, okay, I can ask it now. Um, you could also have an M condensate and it's also a, a it doesn't have to be an E condensate, right? But depending on the boundary condition, it could be an E condensate or an M condensate. And yeah, just, just for this to... argument, if it just, yeah, so you can you can put different boundary conditions here. You get, you get different uh, D-dimensional theories. That's right. But not all of them will have symmetry A. In this Z2 case, there's a duality, so you do. But in general, you really want to choose this Dirichlet boundary condition. I'll say more in a second. Sorry, Ryan. So, so M condensation is a Dirichlet boundary condition, right? In this case, it depends. Uh, okay, it depends on what you mean by. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about these as M lines when I say okay. it's an E condensate. Right. If these are E lines, then it would be. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. Thank you. Also, if you think in terms of like the gauge field, this is like a. It's kind of like a Higgs condensate. Or maybe it's, a, okay, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you should say it's M condensate. There's a duality which makes it confusing. In general, you're not confused. You just say none of the lines end. Okay, so as part of this bulk boundary correspondence, we learned that the, the phase diagram of boundaries of the theory should match the phase diagram of Z2 symmetric phases. So as we already mentioned, there's, there's two gapped boundaries, depending on which of the two uh, bosonic anions you condense at the boundary. So there's this E anion, which is like the charge, and this, this M anion, which is like the flux. And there are also two Z2 symmetric gapped phases, which are you either have a symmetry breaking state or you have a symmetry preserving state. And the question is, which one is which? Well, in Tor code, there's a duality that exchanges E and M. You'd say, okay, they're on equal footing. But we chose this reference boundary condition, Dirichlet. Oh, maybe here. Yeah, it's an E condensate. So choosing the reference boundary condition to be one condensate or the other, you know, whether you think about Dirichlet as the E condensate, which is what I'm doing here, or you think about it as M, that tells you which one is the symmetric, which one is the symmetry breaking state. and the way I wrote it is that the, if, you, if you match the reference boundary condition, so if you have E on both sides, that gives you the symmetry breaking state. And the reason that is, is that it's the other line M. So here I'm thinking about a sum of M lines. So if I just take that line and put it through the system, that's like acting with the global symmetry. That's like acting with the global Z2 symmetry in the effective one plus one D theory. And we see there's an order parameter which is you can have an anion tunnel from one side to the other. And then that operator has a VEV. And because of the braiding of E and M, it's charged under the Z2 symmetry. So this is symmetry breaking. And you can also show it as two ground states on a circle. So that's the mapping of gaps phases. 
And if you study the boundary theories, you find there's a, there's a central charge one half boundary phase transition, which now we understand it's, it's essentially the Ising, it's the Ising transition. It's just at the boundary of this thing. So pretty easy. Um, here's a more involved example with now some non-invertible things going on. So if we study this thing, the, the Kataev honeycomb model in two plus one dimensions. So this is a, this is a spin model on, on a hexagonal lattice with a, a kind of funny looking interaction where you have X bonds, Y bonds, and Z bonds, and they are either ferromagnetic XX, YY, or ZZ, depending on which way they point. And this funny model is actually solvable, um, explained by Kataev and his anions and exactly solved model paper. And the phase diagram is like this, where you have a gapless phase when these couplings are roughly equal to each other. And if we start in this phase and we introduce some magnetic fields, so some, some linear term in the sigmas, that we tend to introduce a non-abelian, uh, a TQFT with, with non-abelian anions. It actually has the Ising, the anions have the Ising fusion rule that's the same as kramers ronyo duality, where you have some non-abelian anion sigma and you have some invertible anion epsilon. Epsilon is like a Z2 anion. Epsilon squared is one and sigma squared is one plus epsilon. And on the boundary of this theory, you see, well, in the, in the formulation of this, in terms of uh, when you map this to fermion variables, you see at the boundary, there's a chiral Majorana fermion. And now the question is, so if we, if we do a cut, so we cut the system, so we turn off all the bonds along some line, then on one edge, you have a, you have a chiral Majorana going this way, and the other edge, you have a chiral Majorana going the other way. If we slowly turn back on these bonds, are these, are these edge modes stable? So this is, this is a question. Maybe somebody knows the answer. I don't know if I want to pass this to the audience, but uh, the naive guess, maybe, I don't know, the, the, rhetor the rhetorical guess, the straw man guess is that any interaction between these two Majoranas should cause some kind of scattering, right? You should expect to be able to generate the mass term of this, of this effective non chiral Majorana if you combine these two modes. So you'd expect maybe this is the simplest interaction you can write between them. Simplest interaction, you know, there's no symmetries in the model, right? Just write down anything. You should expect to generate the mass term. It's not true which is why it's interesting. Um, the edge modes are perturbatively stable. And this is actually the same thing as saying that the, that the Ising CFT is stable under Kramer's Ranye. So I'll be like two, three more minutes. Um, if we, we can map it to this boundary problem by folding the system over the cut. So now rather than thinking about this, uh, this phase diagram of interfaces, it's phase diagrams of boundaries for this doubled theory where you take you take one copy of the theory and one copy of its orientation reversed partner. And it turns out that doubled theories like that, they're, they're equivalent to Turai Vera theory, at least in two plus one dimensions. And they're equivalent to Turai Vera theory based on the category of anions in just one half. So Turai Vera theory tends to double. It's also called the quantum double. So this is essentially Turai Vero theory based on this, based on one of these categories uh, with these fusion rules. So there's two equivalent ones. But anyway, um, we get one of them. And the idea is that if you think about these chiral modes, now we're studying, the problem is equivalent to studying systems with categorical symmetry described by the anions in T. So, what we basically have combining these two chiral Majoranas, it's the Ising CFT with the Kramers Vonnie duality. And there are no symmetric relevant operators, but we expect for some large enough perturbation, you can drive a drive through a tricritical point um, into some gapped phase. And actually that gapped phase is the is the invisible interface when you map it back to this picture. And I'll just advertise this paper uh, of of these people that uh, use this idea 
um, to propose some ways of maybe detecting such a phase. Like it's, a, it's been an experimental challenge to try to find some realization of this, this phase. And you can, you can invent ways of doing it by using these funny selection rules. Yes, Davide. So in the, in the phase diagram you showed before, when you pass across trihedral icing, you get a direct sum of multiple vacua. Yes. Of that vacua. But here you said you find the identity interface. Does it yeah. mean you find other things too on top of the identity interface? It's confusing. Uh, no, it's really just the identity interface. The way that the ground states map is, is a little bit funny. So you have to think about, let's say we take this slab again. So in the, in the middle, we're going to have this, this double, I think they call it Z Ising. And then we have to have a gap to boundary on one side. There's only one gap to boundary, which is the same as this three ground state phase, three times ground state. And then the other side, maybe I shouldn't call it that <laughs> just because it's not gonna have three ground states. I'll just call it the, you know, there's this gapped phase, gapped, this other gapped phase, gapped, and if we think about what are the three ground states in this model, well, if we, if we puff this picture back up, what we're basically doing is we're studying the chiral theory on a torus. And there's three ground states on the torus corresponding to the three anions. But you see on the torus, there's no defect. So if you have a torus with the identity defect, you get three ground states. And that's where the three comes from. Understood, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Yes, Meng. Yes, I'm a little confused by this uh, argument on this page. I mean, if, if I take a slab of this double icing with, uh, sorry, if I take a slab of the K-type model with an icing um, on top and uh, it's anti-icing on the other side, then I can imagine there is a fermion tunneling between the two edges that operator should exist, right? Yeah, I agree. So that's that's a slightly different setup because uh, yeah, so if you, I don't want to put the chiral theory in the middle. Well, I have uh -huh. yours here. I, I want to put the folded theory, right? I want to think about folding it. Then I map yeah. to the question of boundaries of Tri Vero and then I consider the slab of that thing. Okay. But yeah, I, I agree. If you have, if you just have the chiral theory, right? If you just have the chiral theory here, then yeah, if this is thin, you can, this this effective 1D theory, 1D, 1 plus 1D system is just a Majorana. So there's nothing stopping you from having the mass term and generating right. it by tunneling. Then, like how, how is this really different from like the, so this little red line drawer cuts through the K-type model, right? You yeah, it's different. It's it's because this is this is really crucial. Like the, the Majorana can tunnel through the Kataya phase, but mm -hmm. it can't tunnel through the vacuum. So you actually, you can't tunnel across here. But I saw you're, you're asking what happens if I turn back weakly these bonds on, right? Right, and the idea is that you don't get okay. any tunneling until some critical value of the coupling oh, I see. where so there's some tricritical point and then you can tunnel. I see, so you're saying that you cannot tunnel one single Majorana, it's really like gamma times the derivative of gamma and that's irrelevant. Yes, exactly, yeah, okay. and that's... Okay. Uh, yeah, you should check out this paper because they actually okay, use right. that in some transport experiments. I see, I see, that's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm gonna end my talk here, but uh, I'll take the rest of the questions. Um, yeah, so I think Ruben is next. Oh, uh, hey, um, so just a quick follow-up on, on your answer to David's question, just to see if I understood actually. So um, for example, suppose the picture you show on your slide here on the top right, I suppose that was the torus geometry for a moment. And then you cut it, um, right? You, you kind of splice it in half, in a sense. Uh -huh. um, can I think of once you start accessing the, um, what before was this uh, Kramer's, um, Kramer's duality symmetry breaking regime, right? When the coupling is strong, um, uh, basically once you restore the cut, um, can I think of that as indeed having the three-pole degeneracy, but now it just kind of leaks out into the topological degeneracy in the torus, and those are the same stages, or is it unrelated? That's right. So the three-fold degeneracy is kind of the fact, like I, I tried to draw earlier, that the, that the order parameter, when you have these degeneracies, it's always some kind of symmetry breaking, if you think in this term, that the order parameter is like, a, is like an anion tunneling from one edge to the other. 
when you inflate this to a torus, it's really like an anion tunneling all the way around. So what you have is when you have a cut here, the anion can't get across and you don't have any ground state degeneracy. Instead, you have this gapless mode. And then as you increase the bonds, increase the bond strength after this critical point, then the anion can tunnel around and then you get the threefold degeneracy. Oh, perfect, thank you. I also just realized that's what you said already to David and it just took me longer too. <laughs> no understand. problem, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, if you have more questions, feel free to just- So coming back to what we were talking about before, do you know of any example of an interesting categorical symmetry where it's continuous, you know, other than the, you know, trivial ones, like the in, you know, invertible symmetries? Yes, yeah, thanks Thanks for that. So I, I had a lot more to talk about. Uh, well, maybe not that much more. Oh, I already gave away my joke. Um, so yeah, if you study, one thing we did with EFAN is that we, we studied the categorical symmetries in central charge one CFDs and 2D um, as deeply as we could. And there are tons, there are tons of symmetries. Um, yeah, I was gonna warm you up and then say, but wait, there's more and here's the more. Uh, yeah, so there are non-invertible, there are continuous families of non-invertible symmetries. They're maybe not the most exciting because they come from, they come from gauging theory. They come from finite gauging theories that uh, already have continuous symmetry. So if you start with this, if you start with this S1 compact boson with its rotation symmetry, then the topological defect that corresponds to that is this uh, is this like phase slip defect. So it's one where you impose say here's the defect at x equals zero. So you impose boundary conditions that phi from the left and phi from the right differ by, by some by some factor. And this is a topological defect. You can actually check it by looking at the stress tensor, which only involves derivatives of phi, which are continuous across it. And if you look at the, the action of this charge conjugation symmetry C, so I didn't tell you what that is, but it's, it's reflection. It's acting by reflection on this S1. So that negates this parameter alpha right, because it takes, takes phi to minus phi. So if you conjugate this defect or this topological operator, it takes alpha to minus alpha. So when we gauge the symmetry C, this is no longer part of the theory, right? It just doesn't preserve the gauge invariant states. But what you can do is you can consider the sum of the lines. So you can, you can take a sum of lines and basically what it means is that the line itself has some internal degree of freedom that um, in one configuration, you get the alpha phase slip in the other configuration, you get the minus alpha phase slip. And that guy is actually gauge invariant. It's a reducible line in the, in the circle theory, but it gives you an irreducible line in the orbifold. And it gives you a whole family, a whole family for alpha, but now alpha is it's no longer circle valued. Now it takes value from zero to pi or something like that. So it's kind of a funny family. And they're all non-invertible. Like the quantum dimension, I didn't tell you about quantum dimension, but the quantum dimension adds. So here it's two and it's preserved by taking orbifold. This annihilates certain operators. It involves like a projector, like it annihilates twist operators and things like that. Um, annihilate meaning it sends them to non-local operators. Uh, at rational radius, it's even crazier because you have uh, you have the SO four symmetry of the self dual point, and at rational radii, you can relate. Uh, you can get to you can get to any rational radius by gauging different symmetries of the SO four point. So you have like an SO four family, in some sense of uh, topological defects. So there's many of them, but I don't know. I don't know if there are. Yeah, there's, these things even satisfy another theorem. Um, like there's, there's non-local conserved currents associated to these continuous families. So they're conserved currents which live at the end of topological lines. But I don't know if these things occur 
outside of this type of example where you have a theory with a continuous symmetry and then you gauge something that doesn't commute with the continuous symmetry or doesn't normalize it. Well, I have a few questions. What does it mean to have this uh, net current at the end of a line? Yeah, so I wrote it here. Um, if, if you write, say in this simple example, like if, if you write the thing corresponding to the winding symmetry, so this operator d phi is not gauge invariant in the orbifold, but it is gauge invariant if I put it at the end of a Wilson line. Yeah. And if you take d of this thing, of course, d squared is zero, so you're going to remove this, but then here you, you pull down some, uh, you pull down an a. Right, so the covariant derivative of this thing is zero. So it's conserved in that sense. Um, it's also a protected operator in that it's, uh, it's it has dimension one because it defines a marginal operator on the defect. So long as you have a continuous family, is the this dimension can change. Is current in the sense that if you integrate it, you get a conserved charge? So integrating it is hard because it has this line that it ends on, right? But you can, you can integrate it, you can do this. Like if you, if you have one of these defects already, so this is like L alpha, then it, it ends on the, on the end of little L and little L is in the product of L alpha and L minus alpha. And what that means is that, is that little L can end on this line. And we can have our operator here, J of X, and we can definitely integrate this thing along the line. And what that ends up doing is this, this is, this is equal to L alpha plus, you know, plus something. This maybe, uh, what do I want to write here? But basically doing this, like if you're already on the L's, you can move along the family of the L's. So in that sense, it integrates to some charge, but it's integrates to some charges on the line. Yeah, it's sure exactly it marginal defect flow. It's exactly marginal defect flow. Thank you, Sean. The, the other question you explained that, I, I don't think it really penetrated my head. W what does it mean when such a symmetry is spontaneously broken or not? Usually we have a set of properties when the symmetry is spontaneously broken and another set of properties when it's not. But what do yeah, you so here, here um, So in this slab picture, there are like literally order parameters, but the, in general. Sorry, was the question about the continuous symmetries or just in general? Oh, I think I was gonna talk about discrete symmetries. I don't know what it means for the continuous symmetries to be spontaneously broken. Now for the continuous symmetry, it's almost certainly not meaningful because. Well, well what if you took like a, uh, What would be the Goldstone boson? Well, just take your Goldstone boson theory and then gauge C, right? Except that, uh, so you end up reducing the moduli space by Z2. But no, but you have, how do you run Goldstone's theorem when you don't have the standard conserved current? I don't know how to do that, but if you start with the Goldstone mode, <laughs> then you can certainly gauge C and you should expect yeah, that, that it's works. Not clear, but what's not clear is in what sense the remaining massless particle is a, is a Goldstone boson of the spontaneously broken symmetry. Nonsense. I agree. Yeah, you want to know whether it's like created by the current operator. And right, so but there's no standard current. Right. The way you run Goldstone's theorem is you, you cannot run, you cannot imitate Goldstone's theorem for your case because the current is not strictly a current. Yeah, well, you can certainly write down expressions, but I don't know what they mean. I would like to but think maybe about it, it means, if you want to chat about it. Yeah. But yeah, maybe sure. the Goldstone boson will be some state, not in the original Hilbert space, but in some twisted Hilbert space. Right. Yeah. If, if you have. Uh... But my because question was actually more, my question was actually simpler. I think the, the continuous case is just too subtle. So let's discuss, say, imagine Z2. Okay, good. When the symmetry is unbroken, then I understand that's mostly what you discussed. But what does it mean when the symmetry is, is broken? So I'm just going to say that there's there's like multiple ground states that the symmetry acts on non-trivially. 
And that's true in finite volume, infinite volume, what? Yeah, it would have to be true in infinite volume. For these topological theories, it's also true in finite volume. Okay, but so that's just because they're fine-tuned. So the properties of these defects does not depend on any of that, right? Because the properties of these defects is really just about how the symmetries act on the, Hamel, on the Hilbert space. It's not, and the spontaneous symmetry breaking is a statement about the ground state. These are, so the defects don't care about the spontaneous symmetry breaking at all, right? Yeah, so I think what you're saying is that this curly A is still there. Um, one way to say it, which I think might be might be good, is that is to say that uh, when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, you have sort of an emergent, you have an emergent deform symmetry, if you like, which is given by the order parameters. Right now, you have topological operators that are like distinguishing the different ground states, and so you can think about it. Uh, as some kind of like symmetry enlargement, if you want. Um, but actually, for this, uh, once you have, a, if you have a fusion category, we can actually, we actually know how to classify all of the gapped phases. And then we know how to, so this is in one plus one dimension. But I think something like this is going to work in, in any dimension. Like we know how to say whether you have multiple ground states and sometimes how to say, let me let me think if I know how to say what symmetries are broken, what symmetries are unbroken. Yeah, maybe it's so with groups you can always do this thing where you say like, okay, there's some subgroup of symmetries which are unbroken. Right. And I think in this category world, that's you can't always say that. I'm also not clear about the ground state degeneracy because you would like the symmetry operators to act, so act between them. In other words, if you're in finite volume, the symmetry is always realized linearly because you don't have super selection sectors. So I, I don't see the analog of this here. It's kind of messy in the case of say like Kramer's on duality because you have a mapping from say like the, the symmetry preserving state. So I'll, I'll use the, I'll use the Z basis. So the, the symmetry preserving state is like the product of these pluses. And this maps to, maps to a sum sort of, it maps to a cat state. Whereas if I remember correctly like this state, this state is just annihilated. Both of these states, zero and one, map to plus. So there's some funny action on the ground states, and you can uh, you can reason about this by studying basically like uh, they come from the fusion rules themselves. If you just think about like the well, I don't want to necessarily use the torus, but yeah, if you think I wrote it here, so the did I write it here? I feel like I did. But anyway, the, the gapped phases are given by these module categories of A. So basically like the ground states themselves and junctions between the ground states form some kind of category. And the action of A on those defines it as a module category. This, this uh, threefold degenerate state for the Kramer's Vanier uh, symmetry is given by this Ising category acting on itself as a module. So it's three simple objects. Those are the three ground states. And the action is by the fusion rules. So you can label these states rather than writing plus. I can call this state sigma. I can call this state one. I can call this state epsilon. And it acts by the fusion rules. So here, this is fusion with sigma. right? So, so I'm, sigma I'm, squared I'm, is one plus epsilon. I'm very puzzled. So imagine you're in finite volume and you have a this Hilbert space, what, what, what happens then? I feel like it should not work in finite volume. It's just introducing complications that seem unnecessary. Well, I mean, the way when I learned physics, I was always told that when you are at infinite volume, you have complications and you resolve the complications by going to finite volumes and then taking the limit. 
but maybe this point of view is just too conservative and too old fashioned. Well, these topological operators exist in finite volume. Yep, exactly. So you should so, be able to tell the whole story in finite volume and see the symmetry and say what it means when you want it to be spontaneously broken in infinite volume. Yes. Well, I believe I can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking all, these are states. The states that I wrote are all states on the circle. Well, I thought that like for definition, at least for regular symmetry, the way I think about spontaneous entry breaking in, in a way that would be like more compatible with this line picture is just to, you know, if you have, if this symmetry is unbroken, then you can have a, a defect between the ground state and itself. Whereas if it's broken, then it would be a defect between a ground state and a different ground state. Right. Although here it's a little bit funny because some, like for instance, in this uh, kramer zwane broken thing, you have a sum of a spontaneous, a pair of symmetry breaking states for the Z2, and then also the, the symmetry preserving state. So it depends which ground state you're looking in. It's an it's a interesting module. That's why you can't say that there's some like subgroup that's preserved. I see. I think the best you can say is that there's this module category. And then at every object, you can say like this object, you know, there's this class of, there's the lines that fix it's that object. The problem, it's not that you just don't have a subgroup, you don't have a group. Yeah, there's no group at all. There's no not group, even like a no, subgroup. Sub sub there's it's no subgroup. Because it's not invertible. So yes. you don't have a group, and, but you have something. And I'm trying to understand what it means when this something is spontaneously broken. But subcategories should be a well defined thing, right? But you're saying I that, know that I know that the subcategory is a well defined thing, but it's not a yeah. group. So, what does it mean that one thing is broken to another? But I think Ryan was saying that maybe just the idea that you break down to a subcategory is not the right way to think about it here. I mean, maybe, maybe if you study like endomorphisms of your module, which meet with A, don't want to do this. This is somehow like. This is like the dual uh, group, um, dual category with respect to this module, but it includes more than, you know, it's not just a subcategory of A. But it kind of does what you're saying. But yeah, I think you can, you can think about these three states uh, labeled by sigma one and epsilon. And just the, the algebra acting on them by the fusion rules. Can I think of it as like a functor into the category? Because that's another way to define it in the group case. Like you consider a group homomorphism whose target is the original symmetry group. Uh, is that a way to think about it in this case? You're saying to describe M? Or to describe the subcategory. Describe the subgroup. Like the subgroup, I can think of like a subgroup is goes into the original group by the inclusion map. Right. So uh, you have this map from A into the to the endomorphisms of M that defines the module category. There's just not a there's just not a kernel, I guess. Like in groups, you would have a kernel here, right? I don't think you can write a kernel. I don't know. This kind of gets beyond my. Uh, Category theory. So, which one is throw up sorry, on the board. what is M again? M is a module category of A. So that that's just some category uh, where you have such a functor. What you can think about is that the objects of M. So here we're thinking about one plus one dimensions, just because it's simple. You can think about the the simple objects in M are in bijection with the ground states, and it's a category because you have junctions between ground states. You have topological junctions between the ground states. Um, and A acts on it by, by functors. That's the meaning of this map. So those are the same thing as gapped boundaries of derived Vero theory. And they're also the same thing as, as uh, gapped phases with category symmetry A. So in the case where it's just a group, uh, what does that become? Mm. Yeah, so these you can describe these module categories for a group. They include both symmetry breaking and SPT phases. Basically what you get is like 
it's given by a choice of they're really homogeneous in that case in that case you you have some like finite set of simple objects and g acts on them by permutation and then you have some data from the stabilizers but it's a complete orbit so everything is like homogeneous whereas in the in the in other case it's not it's not homogeneous and i mean like here all the objects are on the same footing for instance if you broke g down to h then these objects would be labeled by the cosets g h And it would be like some category of vector spaces uh, labeled, graded by GH, something like that. Uh, by the way, everyone, I have a proposal to uh, thank Ryan Stromgren for the very nice seminar first, post for like 20 seconds and let's thank him again and then we can continue the discussion. Okay, great, I'm gonna use the bathroom. I'll be right back. People can still stay, please. See, I haven't been following a chat, but. Yes, the chat was just asking what is the, is there a local, local order parameter for the, uh, to diagnose a spit symmetry breaking. Hmm. Um, yes, there are, there are local order parameters. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back a little bit, gotta get some more room here. Right. So here I said that. This is like a nice way to construct all of the GATS phases where you have, let me just draw another slab, which we'll is do it in general. So like you have, you have the Dirichlet, you have the Dirichlet boundary condition, and then you have some other general GATS boundary. And then you have in between, you have Turai Vero theory. The order parameters are anions that can tunnel across the slab. And they act by uh, you know, the anions that can tunnel across the slab. So there, so for instance, in this example where we had the E condensate on both sides, the E that can tunnel across is, um, see, the E that can tunnel across an order parameter because it braids with this M line the M line is giving us our symmetry. So here, what we can do to get the, the Ising phase is we take Dirichlet on both sides and there are, there are three anions that can tunnel. You could basically think about this as like inflating into the torus if you like, and they're the anions that can tunnel around the torus and they're they're also labeled you know, one epsilon and sigma. 
So there's a lot of uh, reuse of the same labels. But yeah, these are these are charged local operators with a uh, with a web. They have a web. They're topological. You can move you can move this guy around. There's always some tunneling probability. So the web should depend on the ground state, right? If it's an order parameter. Yeah. So that's also this thing about like inhomogeneous things. So like, uh, yeah. So no, even for so even for the so even in the group case, the order parameter is a function of which ground state you're in, right? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But it can I even really be zero in some ground states. Understand this discussion, even for ordinary one-form symmetries, ordinary in the sense that they are invertible. The this whole story about the local order parameter doesn't apply. Yes, so, but, but the what I mean by local, yeah, that? so there a tunneling event would not be some point operator, be some like string that creates a membrane that goes from one side to the other. So you always have to. Yeah. But, okay, let's discuss Maxwell theory where it's U1. They, they are two U1s, they are spontaneously broken. There is a Goldstone boson, which is the photon, and there is no local operator that condenses. I, I can go and run through all the examples. But, 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 well, but the, the difference Wilson, here but... is that the non invertible symmetry acts on local operator, whereas the one form symmetry doesn't. No, here, like we, get, we allow things like one form symmetries also. It's just that you should change like your notion of locality to fit whatever degree you're in. My question is not about locality, but the question about the meaning of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So for invertible one form symmetries, I think I understand what it means. And what it, I know what it, also what it does not mean. It does not mean that you have a local order parameter that gets an expectation value and so forth. This is, this is just irrelevant. There's another discussion which plays the same role. And I don't need no, to- No, what about like the Wilson line, right? Don't you think that perimeter law means that this thing is broken? That's correct. The perimeter law, but there's no order parameter. There's no local order parameter that gets an extra yeah. value. You didn't follow the chat. The, I'm, I'm responding to comments in the chat. Okay, the story sorry. of a local order parameter that distinguishes between vacua that statement is, is not there. And I was questioning, what's the analogous statement uh, in, in your case? But everything else is true. So there's a perimeter law, there's the number of ground states, you can take the infinite volume limit, and they become a super selection sectors. All the rest follows. Well, in, 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 in the language of those categories, a one form symmetry means that there's no uh, top, no like objects in the category or just one object. So in, in that case, that's why you have to consider not local order parameters. But suppose we have a categorical symmetry that does have more than one okay, well, uh, let's object. Let's first get the ordinary, let's first get the invertible one straight because uh, there, the, so SU3 with some level has a Z3 one form symmetry. Right, or SU2 with a even K has a one form, has a Z2 one form symmetry. You're saying That's a logical field theory. There are objects in the category. Uh, and that, you know, the whole story goes through. So yeah, but the, fact, go the fact that there's no local order parameter for one form symmetry is related to the fact that one form symmetry acts on lines. Rather than local operator. That's but correct. here in, in one plus one D, when Ryan talked about the Kramers one year non invertible defect or line, they act on local operators. Yes. So when they are spontaneously broken, um, in the sense we are trying to figure out right now, there are local operators um, being acted on by the Kramers one year non invertible lines. Okay. The way I kind of think more globally, Ryan's point is that every topological line should be thought of as a symmetry, right? Yes. Okay, so let's discuss SU2 level 18. WZW model, you mean? Sorry? You mean WZW model? we start model? recording, by the way? I mean, yeah. Not if you mean churn Simon theory or WZW model? I'm top, I have a topological field theory in, in three dimensions, say SU2 level 18. Yeah. And there are some number of lines, I'm too lazy to calculate. And Ryan would tell you that every one of them should be thought of as a symmetry. Is that correct, Ryan? 
Yeah, I was trying to write something here that if you have a braided fusion category, oh my God, sorry. I'm very bad at this iPad thing. Uh, braided fusion category that these this actually defines for you something like a fusion two category with a single object. So like Dominic is saying, so you can you can fit these kinds of things and you can say that like this, the lines of Trinsinus theory acts on itself as a symmetry. And in some sense, they're spontaneously broken. And that explains the degeneracy. Good. So I'm happy with that. But in what sense is it spontaneously broken? Is it because you have a number of ground states? Yeah, so not on a sphere, right? So that's why it's kind of weird. Um, but I would think that examples. example is more advanced than the one Ryan talked about, right? So the one that Ryan talked about is one is in one dimension lower. It's in one plus one D. Well, Ryan talked about both. He just talked about this one. Well, one of the first examples of spontaneously breaking that Ryan mentioned is this Kramer's one year spontaneous breaking phase. Maybe that would be a starting point. That's in one plus one D. That's one of the phase of the tricritical ice model. Yeah, well, these are a lot, these I think are a lot easier than the than the example because they because they you only have a circle to consider That's right. states on. So there are right. going to be local operators, That's local right. order parameters. So I think that would be an easier starting point to straight things out. I think but do we have to go back to that or are we already on to <laughs> thinking about Trinsimon's theory? I would like to understand better like what the I think this two category thing is also like yeah, um, I guess if you were to study module categories, module, you know, two categories over this thing, even ones with a single simple object, like it acts on itself, right? And that's supposed to describe the ground states of this Trent-Simons theory with the action of the lines. So even though it has one object, it's, it's somehow broken, it's, but it's broken in like in higher degrees or something. But I can say what it means for everything to be unbroken, <laughs> which is somehow easier. Yes, I completely agree. With that. That's the easy one. That's why I asked about the spontaneous the broken one. Okay. Yeah. Because there, it's almost like a symmetry. It's act on the Hilbert space. We can do it in infinite volume. We don't have all these other problems. Right. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. It's a, it's a really interesting question, though. Matthew, are you going to be at Stony Brook next week? Sorry? Are you going to be at Stony Brook for our thing? Uh, uh, virtually, yeah. OK. Talk. Wait, okay. only virtually? You're not coming physically? No, I'm not coming physically. I, I, I have a very okay. busy week, because the I following see. day, I have to be in uh, Switzerland. Uh, virtually. Okay. Virtual. I will also be virtually in Switzerland. Uh -huh. uh, there are a bunch of things I need to do at IAS, and I'm on some committee.